Welcome to the lecture for Module 10 on Non-Western Approaches to International Relations. In this lecture, we'll talk about the role that non-Western approaches play in our thinking about international relations, and then look at three different types, Asian IR, Global South International Relations, and Indigenous Perspectives. So to begin, IR theory is primarily based on Western ideas developed by Western thinkers that mainly focus on Western countries. And so what this highlights is that we cannot take for granted that those ideas promoted by those scholars that apply in those areas apply universally to everywhere and to all different kinds of people. So those assumptions and concepts that we have already discussed throughout the course of this semester may not map neatly onto the experiences of people, especially in the developing world. So this leads us with the question, how might IR theory be different if we were to look to non-Western perspectives instead? What sorts of insights might we gain? So let's look at three different branches of non-Western perspectives. First, there's Asian international relations. What's important about this is that the people who advocate for this kind of a perspective argue that there was nothing exclusively Western about IR theorizing. And in fact, there are very well-known theorists in Asian countries who have focused on the kind of issues that you know, even some of our well-known Western scholars from antiquity, uh, like Machiavelli uh, and Immanuel Kant, have talked about throughout history. Asian IR advocates for what's called conceptual pluralism, which means that Asian IR is not a single approach, but rather a range of perspectives that is related to, but importantly, separate from IR scholarship from the Global South, which we'll discuss next. The common thread that unites the different kinds of Asian IR approaches, be they Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Korean, or so on, is that they provide normative thinking about the way the world ought to be, or as, as we've seen from some of our earlier theories like realism, for example, that they do not attest to provide any kind of moral vision for how the world should operate. Another thing that's important is that unlike some of those earlier theories, uh, Asian IR tends to focus more on what's called middle range theorizing, which explains specific events rather than broad phenomena. An example of this in, in action can be seen with the non-alignment movement, which originated from India and permeated it throughout the developing world. The idea of non-alignment was that there were certain positions that were helpful for developing countries, especially those in Asia, to have during the Cold War when they didn't have to choose a side between the United States and the Soviet Union, and they could benefit by having relationships with both of them without having to neglect uh, either diplomatic, economic, or other kinds of interactions with either the U.S. or the USSR. Um, the next approach is Global South. Uh, they start by saying that mainstream IR theory does not reflect the reality of experiences from people who live in this part of the world, which generally speaking refers to those who are below the equator, with exceptions like Australia and New Zealand. There are questions that are important to people in the global south, but they have been under theorized or completely ignored by mainstream IR theories. And like in the case of Asian IR, there is no single unified IR theory for people in the global south so it simply refers to a range of approaches. The goals of Global IR, uh, Global South IR, are to incorporate non-Western actors and non-Western thinking into IR scholarship, provide avenues for fairer relations between states and within international institutions that typically don't provide a lot of opportunities for the Global South to participate or to take a leadership stake in the way that those organizations operate. Global South perspectives examine IR from the perspective of post-colonial states. Um, for example, they look at the persistence of inequalities that exist between countries in the North and South, um, especially those that are uh, the former colonizers and those that they colonized. An example of glo a Global South approach can be seen in the characterization of China's approach to international relations, which might be described not as rational, like we see in the case of realism or liberalism, but as relational, in that it focuses more on sort of dyadic or even regional relations between China and parts of the developing world, and what they can learn through mutual respect and admiration, interdependence, non-interference, as opposed to thinking about uh, the relationship between China and other countries 
uh, following the logic of economic principles derived from you know, Western theorizing. And then finally, indigenous approaches. Indigenous understandings of international relations involve sacred commitments, relationships to the natural world, the importance of culture as opposed to nations, and promoting diverse ways of conducting relations among people and kin, which can extend beyond the human world. These perspectives offer three specific challenges to a state-centric perspective on international relations. First, it disputes state authority over nations, land, water, and nature. Second, it exposes colonial foundations of the modern state system. Third, it compels us to consider alternative ways of sharing power and organizing into political communities, like in the form of tribes. Uh, and then there are ways in which indigenous perspectives interface with IR, which include treaties with the natural world, reestablishing alliances between indigenous peoples, which may cross the traditional state or nation state boundaries, and indigenous advocacy in global forums. So an example of indigenous approaches in practice can be seen in the role that indigenous groups play in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, where even though indigenous peoples do not represent a specific nation state, which is a party to this international environmental treaty, they are nevertheless welcomed to contribute their ideas and have been deemed an essential partner in promoting and achieving the Paris Climate Accord from 2015. And so this is an example of where a particular type of non-state actor, in this case, indigenous groups, are given greater agency and authority in the international system, even though they don't cleanly fit alongside our traditional ideas about what constitutes an actor in international relations, like a nation state. 